Welcome to a series of videos from Chapter 10 addressing the issue of lateral bracing. The term lateral bracing suggests holding the building from falling over sideways and we do need bracing to help uh, that uh, stability to occur because even under gravity loads things can collapse by falling over sideways. So that's where the term lateral bracing came from. But these systems, in fact, resist in an active way horizontal forces of any kind on the building. In other words, they're there to resist uh, horizontal wind forces and seismic forces and any other kind of horizontal forces that uh, the building might be subjected to. So chapter 10 is dealing with that issue exclusively. And by the way, it's one of the most important issues that architects deal with because in the design of your building you have to figure out where you can put things like cross bracing or braced frames of any kind and you have to be able to weigh the cost for example of a braced frame versus a rigid frame. So in this first video from uh, chapter 10 section 1 we're going to talk about the basic bracing system types we're going to define the major types. We're going to talk about, in particular, footings for pure gravity columns. And that might include uplift forces of wind suction. And then we're going to delve into the general issues for footings that are part of a braced, uh, a part of braced frames. So here we have a very simple model that shows a structure being pushed to the side. In this case, we're observing a fairly amount, a substantial amount of deformation in the horizontal spanning elements uh, because they're made out of chipboard and because the columns in this case are made out of wood and wood is much stiffer than chipboard. We're seeing most of the deformation in the chipboard. But this gives you an idea of an issue that we have to deal with in buildings. We can't just throw up some columns and throw up some floors and hope that that structure is going to resist wind load because in all likelihood, if you haven't designed it to do that, it's not going to work for that. One of the ways we can stabilize the building is with something we call a shear wall. This could be masonry, it could be concrete, could be wood studs and some kind of diaphragm material such as plywood or oriented strand board. Uh, we see a lot of this because it's very economical. You have to have a wall for enclosure and often we can make that enclosure wall with a little extra effort work as a shear wall and that becomes the source of stability in the building. The key architectural point here is that the um, structural logic can only be maintained if the windows and doors that are cut in these walls are fairly modest in dimension, which gives rise to what I refer to sometimes as the punched opening aesthetic, which is what we see in a lot of sort of standard architecture. Um, I'm a great believer in good daylighting, which is not accommodated by having large portions of opaque wall. I'm also a believer in um, panoramic windows. I think that those are the most satisfying to human beings and these punched openings don't qualify in that way. A uh, second kind of bracing is uh, triangulation. In this case we're showing some cross bracing but there are a lot of different uh, configurations that this triangulation can take. Uh, it can certainly accommodate ventilation, wonderful daylight. Typically cross bracing is so minimal in dimension it does not significantly affect anyone's view outside. In this particular case though we would have some issues walking through this if we wanted to put a door down on the bottom floor. So we have to be careful where we put it because it interferes with some pretty significant architectural functions such as moving around inside the building or exiting the building. 
The third and final kind of lateral bracing system is called a rigid frame. It's only different from this in manner of degree. Uh, in this situation, we start off with some kind of standard wall for enclosure. And by not cutting very big holes in it, uh, that wall maintains its structural integrity and it's not damaged enough by those holes that it doesn't continue to work as a lateral bracing system. Uh, we can make those holes larger and larger and eventually we have to think carefully about what's left of the wall because it has a much higher moment and much higher stresses and at some point we have to consciously design it and that's when we start talking about a rigid frame even though this is only different in degree from a shear wall in that um, we've created a large opening and what remains of the opaque portion of the building needs to be really carefully designed to function to resist the lateral forces on the building. Okay, so the first part of this series of lectures, we're going to focus on um, braced frames. And this is an example of cross bracing. Um, and cross bracing tends to work really fine on really low rise buildings, which don't have a lot of uh, shear force or overturning moment on them. And here is a classic example that we've talked about before. Here we have a frame consisting of this member, that vertical, the grade beam, and this vertical. Um, and it's not a rigid frame because if you look at these connections between that member and that member, it's really flimsy. And if you try to use it for any structural purposes, it would cause a lot of damage really quickly. But by triangulating this, we're giving ourselves an extremely good lever arm. So you can think of this, this entire braced frame or cross braced frame as a cantilever coming out of the ground and it's cantilevering this much in the vertical direction and it has a depth that's that much so it's actually not cantilevering as far as its depth so this would be what we would consider a really excellent uh, proportion for a cantilever from a structural point of view um, clearly we wouldn't normally design something like that but if we have a frame here which we don't need to walk through for any reason or drive vehicles through then in fact we can put this cross bracing in it and what we have bought ourselves is this super efficient cantilever that's only cantilevering that far out of the ground and has this much structural depth and that efficiency by the way is expressed in the super lightweight nature of this cross bracing which, as I mentioned, is so lightweight that in terms of obstructing the view, it has almost no effect. So you can get ventilation and view and light through this cross-braced bay. You just can't walk through it because the bracing is too low. This is another example of exactly the same thing. Here we have some rigid frames, uh, rigid in this direction where the structure is very deep and has a moment connection but relative to forces parallel to this member um, the frame consists of that member this member the gray beam and this member and then we have this cross bracing to stabilize it now while i'm here i want to mention the following this cross bracing under wind load in this direction this member goes into tension and it's resisting, uh, it's exerting a force on the foundation that's a horizontal force in that direction. And that the foundation is resisting that force by uh, exerting a horizontal force in, in this direction. Um, this member is also exerting an upward force on that foundation and under the right circumstances it can literally tear the footing out of the ground if the footing is not heavy enough and the wind load is high enough 
And by the way, structures of this sort, this rigid frame structure, are actually incredibly light. And in this case, the roof weighs almost nothing because it's this thin plastic material. So the wind loads would easily lift this structure out of this footing unless the footing is large enough. So we're going to talk in detail about what the implications are of a braced frame in terms of how it affects the footings. Uh, but I want to just mention that at the moment. So we can have a structural system that works something like this. It's a fairly low rise building. We're choosing one bay to triangulate. In this case, we're triangulating it with something called a chevron bracing. And really important things are happening to these footings under wind load in the direction shown. In other words, going this way, we're getting some deformation in the structure. So this was the original shape. This is the deformed shape. We have tension lifting this footing upward, compression in this member that's driving this footing down deeper. These footings have to be heavy enough. If there's any uplift, they have to be heavy enough to keep from lifting up. The narrower this base, the greater the probability of uplift, of a net uplift. Uh, the taller the building is, the greater the probability of a net uplift on this footing. So these footings, by the way, are very different from these. These footings have no triangular brace coming into them. They have no uplift force, except in the case of this building, we might have some wind suction on the roof. But that wind suction at, at the most extreme would barely overcome the self-weight of the roof. Um, it'll, and that 20 pounds a square foot or so of uplift wind load will never overcome the weight of this floor slab, much less two of these floor slabs. So in the case of this column and that column, there's no net wind uplift to pull up on the footing. There's no bracing connecting into the footing to pull up on the footing. So these footings will act in pure compression under wind load or excuse me under any loading condition on the building the force in these columns is essentially gravity only and the base or the footing will be designed accordingly so here we have a footing of this, that type it's actually in a fairly tall building and um, it's supporting several floors and as a consequence the dimension of this footing across this way is 12 feet and across this way is 12 feet but we know that this is a pure gravity uh, footing for a column that is always in compression and the way we know that is the following the column is going to bolt to these anchor bolts which are going to be embedded in the concrete that gets filled up to this level down at the bottom of this footing, we have this crisscrossing steel. That steel is there to work in tension, and it's there to work under a downward gravity force on this footing, which is going to tend to create tension in the bottom of the footing. If we had net uplift, we'd have tension in the top of the footing also, and we'd have to see some steel there to resist it. In this case, there's no steel there, because this building is tall enough and heavy enough and furthermore by the nature of the way it's configured there is no bracing uh, to exert any upward force on this footing so it's a pure gravity footing we only have four anchor bolts and they're mainly there for alignment purposes and to keep the column from ever getting knocked out of place if somebody ran a forklift truck into it or something. So this is what that looks like close up and interestingly enough all it takes is one nut here to make the anchorage even if this were working in tension but it's not working in tension so in fact we don't really even need a nut there we could just have this rod coming up because the rod is there for alignment to keep the column from slipping out of place. Now you'll notice here that 
This is a plywood plate which has been very precisely drilled to fit the pattern of bolts in the base plate of the building. There's a nut down below here and a nut above and both those nuts will be there when the column arrives. So this nut and the nuts on top will get removed. The column will get lowered down over these anchor bolts and then these nuts will be put on. The bottom nuts we call leveling nuts and the column literally rests on those. Um, if, if it's a column with a huge amount of gravity load in it, we may grout underneath the base plate. But if it's not a heavily loaded column, the column will literally sit on these nuts. Because these nuts basically develop the full capacity of the threaded portion of this bolt. And so uh, if the bolt is adequate, to support those gravity loads, then the nuts will be also. Again though, it depends on the situation whether anyone grouts underneath that base plate. So this shows um, that anchor bolt. Um, the concrete in this footing has been poured. The anchor bolts are embedded down in the concrete. This is that plywood plate, not looking so much like plywood anymore because they slopped uh, concrete all over it during the pouring process. But nonetheless, this is that 12 foot by 12 foot footing with this um, series of four anchor bolts at the center, which will receive the base plate of the column. And this is what that column would look like when it's finally in place. Uh, this is the concrete footing. This right here is just the slab, which has been poured to an appropriate depth and, and turned down at this point. And the reason there's material that's a back away from it is we typically pour some more concrete around this column, but we put some uh, fibrous elastic material between this concrete and the new concrete that we're gonna pour in order that um, any kind of thermal expansion or contraction of this concrete will not do dam damage to the base of the column. And this is uh, another view of a column just to show that condition where we have the leveling nuts and the lock nuts uh, on the top. And again, uh, this column might have gotten grouted, but at this point in the construction, every indication is it's not grouted now and it may not ever be grouted because these little stubby columns may be all that's necessary to support the load. Um, I just show this because here the footing got poured a little high and then when they came back they wanted to establish in a very precise way the elevation of this base plate so they had to come in and hammer out some concrete here um, to make room to rotate this leveling nut so that they could get the column uh, situated vertically and with appropriate orientation to be within specs in terms of its physical location. Okay, so we've talked about the basic notion of bracing. In this case, it's one bay of the building that's braced. Um, and we talked about the fact that these columns are behaving completely differently. These columns are pure vertical force members, and in this case, they're always compressive downward forces because the gravity loads will never be overcome by any wind suction on the roof, and because there are no bracing elements coming into either this footing or that footing, there's no bracing action that's creating any uplift on the footing. And so we've all gone through and we've talked about what the nature of this footing should be. In the next video, we're going to start talking about these footings and the whole nature of this brace frame system for stabilizing the building. So that concludes our first video from Chapter 10 on basic bracing system types. We've talked about what those types are. They are shear walls, uh, triangulation, or braced frames, and rigid frames. And we've defined footings for pure gravity columns, and we defined the general issues for put footings that are part of braced frames.